This video is a ministry of the First Baptist Church, Pampa, Texas. We are located at 203 Northwest Street in downtown Pampa. Join us for worship this Sunday or visit us on our website at firstpampa.org. Now enjoy the rest of the broadcast. Thank you guys and thank you kids for helping us uh, distribute those. Uh, if anyone would like to come up front after the service and pick up all these leaves, that'd be great too. We'd love to have you up here at the front. Didn't think through that part. Turn in your Bible to Colossians chapter 1 this morning. Colossians chapter 1. This, is, uh, this morning is the second half of last week's message. Let me remind you what we talked about last week out of Colossians 1 verse, uh, verse 10 about how uh, Paul's prayer for the church at Colossae and in fact the, the, the prayer for us as believers is that we live a life worthy of the Lord or that we live a life that is becoming or fitting or appropriate of the Lord. And what this does not mean is that if we have a lot of good works, we will somehow become worthy of salvation. I think we showed last week how there's not ever anything we could do that would be enough to earn salvation. So, so salvation is never ours because of our worth, but salvation is available because of the worth of the Savior who came. God so loved the world that he gave his son. That's where the worth, that's where our worth comes from. It's from our Savior. So we can't do anything. So to live a life worthy of the Lord does not lead, mean to live a life that somehow might meet God's approval and therefore attain salvation, but it does mean to live a life in a manner that is becoming, a, a manner that is fitting or appropriate for a person that uh, is a, a follower of Christ. One, uh, to, to live our life in such a way that it honors the Lord. And I left you with this last question. Are you becoming a person that is becoming of the Lord? Are you becoming a person? Is that an ongoing process in your life that is becoming of the Lord, that is fitting, that is appropriate for Him, that is suitable for Him? Are you becoming a person that looks good on Him? And that's one of the last things I challenge you with is, is that when you're becoming a person that is becoming of the Lord, it looks good on you. It looks good on you, just like some people will wear a dress or, or, a, or a suit or something like that or a new haircut, and they'll say, oh, that, that's very becoming. Well, it, it looks good on you to live a life that is becoming to be becoming of the Lord looks good on us. It looks good on God's followers, looks good on God's children. This morning, I want to take you to the second part of that verse in verse 10, that, that not only uh, are we challenged in, in Paul's prayer that we become people who are becoming or worthy, live a life worthy of the Lord, but also that we please the Lord in every way. And that's what I want to focus on this morning, give you three ways that we please the Lord, or three ways that we live with a desire to please the Lord in verse 10. It says, and we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way. And then he lists the three, bearing fruit in every good work, number one, growing in the knowledge of God, number two, and number three, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might that you, so that you may have great endurance and patience joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. Let me share with you this morning those three ways that within this prayer we find that we can live a life with a desire to please the Lord, a pleasing life. Number one is a life that is bearing fruit in every good work. A pleasing life is a life that is bearing fruit in every good work. You know, works are things like obedience and actions and and attitudes, things like that. Good works result in good fruits. That makes sense, doesn't it? Good works result in good fruits. Bad works or bad deeds result in, in bad fruits. Well, the kind of good fruit born in good works is not talking about, in this passage of scripturally, it's never talking about a good fruit in worldly means. So when we read this, say, well, if you do good things, then you're going to become wealthy. Or if you do good things, you're going to achieve a powerful position. Or if you do good things, you'll have a lot of money. 
Well, that's not what it's talking about because good fruits that the Bible gives are things like this. Fruits of the Spirit found in Galatians chapter 5. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Other good fruits include things like Christ-like attitudes and actions. But notice this, what, the, what this verse says. It says that we may uh, bear fruit in every good work. In every good work. Not just in the big things. Some people look at life like this. They think, well, if I'm going to be pleasing to God in the major choices, you know, who I'm going to marry, what God, job I'm going to take, you know, some of those big, big life choices, what I'm going to do with my life, then I'm going to make the right choice for that so that I bear good fruit. But here's the key. The way that you make good choices which result in good works and yield good fruits is not just in the big things, but it begins in the small things. Because in reality, it's in the small details of life. It's in the mundane things. It's in the daily attitudes and actions and choices. and It's in the small things of life that our character is formed. And not only that our character is developed, but that our character is displayed. So when, when Paul says his prayer is that they may bear fruit in every good work, he's not talking about just the big things. Look at this quote that, that's uh, coming up on the screen before you from Charles Spurgeon, a great uh, 19th century preacher in England, said this. He said, do not select only big things as your specialty, but also glorify the Lord in the littles. Glorify the Lord in the littles. We don't necessarily use that expression anymore but listen, it's in the littles that you bear good fruit. Because if you are, are, are intentional and honoring to the Lord in the littles of life, and they begin to bear fruit, then you're going to make the right choices when the biggies come along. And then that's going to bear even more significant fruit. But in every good work, we're to live a life, we're to make choices, we're to live in such a way that bears good fruit. So a pleasing life is a life that is bearing fruit in every good work. Secondly, a pleasing life is a life that is growing in the knowledge of God. A life that's growing in the knowledge of God. Now there are two words we find typically used in the New Testament for knowledge and one, or, or to know something, to know about someone, or to know someone in a relational sense. One of those is found in Philippians 3.10. Philippians chapter 3, verse 10, Paul is is talking about his pursuit of God. And he says this, he said, I want to know God and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings. I, I don't know if you've ever prayed that prayer, but it's a biggie. I mean, that's, that's a biggie. If you pray that prayer, what Paul is praying in there when he says, I want to know God, in that use, the word know is a verb. But the word know that we find over in, Phili in Colossians chapter 1, it's a noun. And it's a word that it means something a little bit different. But in Paul's sense, in Philippians chapter 3, what he's saying is that, that I want to know, I want to experience. It's an active verb tense where I want to experience and truly encounter the power of the resurrection. We're all for that, right? But to also pray, I want to experience the fellowship of sharing with his sufferings. Oh, I don't know if I want that. Well, let's just be honest. That's a whole different deal. To experience the fellowship of his sufferings? Well, that means Paul says, I want to know, I, my passion for God is so much that I want to experience him no matter what it is, good or bad hard or easy. I want to know him. That's in the verb tense, gnosko, the word that's used in Philippians chapter 3, verse 10. But in Colossians chapter 1, we find a different form with the same root word. In Colossians chapter 1, it's used in a noun form. And in this case, it means that I want to, that, that Paul's desire for them is that they may grow, again, another ongoing process, that they may grow in the knowledge of God. In this sense, it's not in the experiential knowledge, but to know in this form means that, 
His desire for them is that they may grow in acknowledging God, that they may grow in discerning the ways of God, not experiencing God the same way he was referring to the church at Philippians, but to know in discerning his ways. What he's saying is this, is that I want you to grow. His desire for us, God's desire for us, is not only to experience him, but to grow in recognizing him, to grow in acknowledging him, to grow in discerning his ways. Now, I, let, me, let me try to illustrate it this way. I am, I'm, I'm pretty sure, one of the world's worst gift givers. I'll just, my wife's here, and I'll just admit it in front of God and everybody. I'm, you know, some of you people that have all these creative ways to give gifts, you know, God bless you, that's not me. I mean, I'm the guy who, and this is no slight on her, but I'll just honestly tell you, I remember one particular Sunday that we got to church and Sunday school started when I was a youth minister and everybody went in, classes got started, and I had to go to CVS to buy a Mother's Day card because I'd forgotten all about it. I mean, I'm that guy, okay? <laughs> like one of our dear men was doing this morning as well. <clears throat> but here's what I do know. To, to mothers or any of us, it's not so much that you've got a, just some random gift. But when you know them to the point that you discern what they really want, when you acknowledge, hey, what they really want is time, or maybe there's, some, maybe there's some tangible thing they've really wanted, and when you know that without them saying, hey, I really wish you'd get me this for Mother's Day, but you perceive that and you know it, then that's a whole lot more pleasing to them to receive it than just some other random gift. Do you follow me? So you know your wife or you know your mother, you discern what they want without them having to ask for it. That's what this means. This means that Paul's desire for us and, and the, really the desire and the pursuit of Christianity is that we grow in the knowledge of him, that we discern his ways that we discern and we readily recognize what it is that God wants. You know, what God wants from us is not elusive. He's not hiding his desire from us. In fact, he makes it quite clear. He wants our lives. He wants our worship. He wants our obedience. He wants our faithfulness. All of those things are things that God wants. But what pleases him is that when, or, or those times that we recognize it and we discern what he wants and we freely offer that to him. See, a pleasing life is a life that bears fruit in every good work. A pleasing life is a life that is growing in the knowledge and discernment of God and obedience to him that follows that. Thirdly, in this verse, we see that a pleasing life is a life that is strengthened with all power. A life that is strengthened with all power. And then it gives two, two evidences of strengthened with power. And he's not talking here about physical strength. He's not talking about necessarily toughness. But what he, what he describes later in verse, uh, well, this is actually in, in verse 11, being strengthened with all power so that you might have great endurance and patience. Have you ever prayed for patience? I, I made the mistake of preaching on patience years ago. And when it was over, I thought, I will never preach on patience again. So I'm not preaching on patience. Just for the record, I'm not preaching on patience right now. I had a lot of people say, don't ever preach on patience. In fact, somebody gave me a sign that's up here in my study that says patience. Well, patience is one of those things that doesn't come easily. Endurance, you don't get any endurance by just taking shortcuts. You get endurance by the hard stuff. You don't get endurance by cutting corners. You get endurance by, by pushing through when it gets difficult. And Paul's prayer for the church at Colossae, the desire of God for us is that we not only bear fruit in every good work, because really that's not all that tough, not only that we grow in the knowledge of him, because I would say, well, that's not that hard, but this one really gets tough. 
Because there's no, there are no shortcuts to becoming strengthened. There are no shortcuts to growing in endurance. There are no shortcuts in becoming a patient person. If you know any, let us know, and we'll just all become rich, and you know, life will be great. There are no shortcuts. But God's desire is that we grow in such a way that we not only, uh, not only do good deeds that bear fruit in, in every uh, good work, not only that we grow in knowledge and discernment of Him, but God's desire is that we be strengthened so that we might push through, so that we might endure, so that we might be able to go through the hard stuff. But, but then it gets worse. Not only just so that you endure through the hard stuff, but that you endure through the hard stuff with joy, giving thanks to God. Look at this verse again. Colossians chapter 1, verse 11, being strengthened with all power according to His glorious might, so that you might have great endurance and patience, joyfully giving thanks to the Father. He really raised the bar then. It's not enough that we just are strong enough to endure some hard times. No. To grow in Him, to grow in knowledge of Him, to be strengthened spiritually, strengthened in our faith, is not to just endure some hard times, but it's to, it's to endure with joy, giving thanks to God all the way through. Whew. That just became a tall order, didn't it? Endure with joy. I've known many people through the years that have endured with bitterness. That doesn't mean that they're not saved, but it, it means that they've missed out on the victory that comes through joy. Well, it's, it, it is no desire of God that we endure something just to come out on the other side bitter or angry or frustrated. But His desire for us is that we persevere with joy. Remember what James chapter 1 says? Count it all joy when you face trials of many kinds, knowing that the testing of your faith, knowing that as you're going through that, the, the fire that you're going through, it's serving to build perseverance into your life and patience. So what the Word is saying, a life that is pleasing to God is not just somebody that gets through it. But it pleases God that we get through it joyfully. Giving thanks to God. And let me wrap up with these, these thoughts. Notice something that's similar in each of these. First, desire that you are bearing fruit or being fruitful. That's a verb, active tense. Desire that you are growing or increasing in knowledge of God. That's a verb, active tense. The third one in being strengthened, being strengthened, growing in your strength is another, the root, there's another verb. And here's the bottom line to, to all of this. And we said it last week. A person who will, Paul's desire to walk worthy, to live a life worthy, is an ongoing process. Pleasing God having a desire to please God, it's an ongoing process. Th there's not a point where you can say, I have pleased God, I don't have to worry about that anymore. God's happy with me when I was baptized. Well, He is. And that does please God, but that doesn't mean you pleased Him then and you don't ever have to worry about it again. It doesn't mean, well, I made this big decision, I married who He wanted me to marry, or I took this job, or I served the Lord, or I gave that offering... I don't have to do anything else because I pleased him past tense. No. Pleasing God is an ongoing, lifelong process of becoming a person that is becoming to the Lord. And let me leave you with that question once again. Are you becoming a person that is becoming to the Lord? by living a life that is worthy of the Lord, 
and by pleasing him in every way. Would you bow your heads with me for a moment? Some of you this morning, you, you might know exactly what's going, in and what's going on in your life that's keeping you from being pleasing to him. Maybe you know that your life's not been bearing good fruit because you haven't been making good choices. Because you haven't been exercising good wisdom and, and good deeds. And so what you've seen in your life are not good fruits, but bad fruits and bad consequences. I want to take you back to the beginning and say, would today you go before the Lord and say, God, in my life, in the littles, starting today in the little, small choices, attitudes, and actions of every day, God, my desire is to be pleasing to you. My desire is to be pleasing to you. If there's an area that you need to confess to the Lord, do so. And repent. Don't go back and do the same thing again tomorrow morning. Leave it behind and pursue Him. Pursue a life that pleases God. While pleasing God is an ongoing process, there has to be a beginning point. The beginning point of living a life that pleases Him is when you come to the point in your life where you trust Jesus as your Lord and Savior, where you place your faith in Him and say, God, I want to I give my life to You. God, I confess my sin and acknowledge that I've never been saved. Lord, I've tried to do things that would make You happy. But there's never been a time in my life where I trusted Jesus once and for all as the Lord and the leader of my life. And today, this Mother's Day in 2017, I want this to be the day that I draw a line in the sand and say today, and I'm making this decision not to please my mother, but I'm making this decision to please the Lord. Well, I'll tell you what, it'll make your mother happy too. But today, do you need to choose Him as the Lord of your life? That you be pleasing to Him in every way. If that's you today, would you pray this prayer? Just say words or words similar to these in your heart. Dear Lord, I admit that I've not been the person that I could be. And I admit that I've done a lot of things wrong. And God, I need your forgiveness. I know that I can never earn heaven or earn forgiveness of my own abilities. So Lord, today I place my faith 100% in you. And I trust you as my Lord and my Savior. Please forgive my sin. And from this point forward, I want to live a life that is pleasing to God. Friend, if you prayed that prayer this morning or it's the first time that you actually prayed it and, and it meant something to you, I want to challenge you. In just a moment, we're going to begin to sing a song. Myself and Daniel and Richard will be here at the front. I encourage you to slip out in a way that's pleasing to God, not to please me, not to please somebody else. But God, when he called people, he told people to take a public stand of obedience for him. If that's you and you prayed to trust Jesus as the Lord of your life, I encourage you to slip down here to one of us and give us the privilege of praying for you as you admit that for the first time this morning. It could be that you need to respond to the Lord by seeking his forgiveness, confessing sin to him, sin in your life that's not been pleasing. However the Lord speak into your heart, would you respond in obedience to him today? Obeying God, say, God, I know what you want. God, I will obey.
Father, thank you for your truth. Thank you for your desire to continually be active in our lives. Thank you for your desire uh, that we might become people that are suitable and becoming, that looks good on you, that looks, makes you look good. Lord, if there are any that need to respond openly,